From exoplanets to supermassive black holes to the first stars and galaxies, James Webb is showing us the universe as we've never seen it before. It has transformed humanity's view of the cosmos, peering into dust clouds and seeing light from faraway corners of the universe for the very first time. But while James Webb continues to provide answers about the earliest days of the universe, it's also discovering more questions. This state-of-the-art time machine just detected mysterious primordial galaxies that threatened to break cosmology. Join us as we dig deep into James Webb's new shocking discoveries that will break your brain. The universe is 13.8 billion years old. The oldest light ever observed was seen by NASA's Cosmic Background Explorer Mission, or COBE for short. Launched in 1989, COBE measured the cosmic microwave background, the faint relic radiation filling all of space, created just a few thousand years after the Big Bang. James Webb is designed to explore a subsequent epoch in which the universe was roughly 100 million years old. During this time, the first stars and galaxies formed. Thus, researchers expect that James Webb will be able to study the earliest galaxies and supernova produced by the universe's first stars. Its large aperture and infrared capability enable astronomers to explore, for the first time, this period of galaxy formation. These data will help astronomers determine which of their theoretical models of how the universe evolved is correct. Most recently, the James Webb Space Telescope has just discovered that nearly all of the universe's earliest galaxies were filled with dazzling gas clouds that blazed brighter than the emerging stars within them. And it could help solve a mystery that threatens to break cosmology. Forming as early as 500 million years after the Big Bang, some early galaxies have been seen glowing so brightly that they shouldn't exist. Brightnesses of their magnitude should come only from massive galaxies with as many stars as the Milky Way, yet the galaxies took shape in a fraction of the time our galaxy took to form. The discovery threatened to upend physicists' understanding of galaxy formation, and even the standard model of cosmology, which states that a few million years after the Big Bang energy condensed into matter, from which the first stars slowly coalesced. However, when James Webb came online, it saw far too many stars like this. As a result, James Webb just made the crisis in cosmology worse. But while threatening the reigning cosmological model, James Webb also tries to solve the most puzzle about the universe. Based on data obtained by James Webb, astronomers have found a possible answer. A large group of 12 billion-year-old galaxies, almost 90% of which were wreathed in bright gas that, after being ignited by light from the surrounding stars, triggered intense bursts of star formation as the gas cooled. The new research has been accepted for publication in the Astrophysical Journal. According to lead author Anshu Gupta, an astrophysicist at Curtin University in Australia, our paper proves that interactions with the neighboring galaxies are responsible for the unusual brightness of early galaxies. The explosion of star formation triggered by the interactions could also explain the more massive nature of early galaxies. Astronomers discovered the bright gas clouds in data collected as part of Webb's Advanced Deep Extragalactic Survey, which used three of the telescope's instruments to collect infrared images of galaxies before analyzing their spectra. By peering at the frequencies of light the galaxies emitted, the researchers discovered spikes of extreme emission features, a clear sign that the gas was capturing light from nearby stars before re-emitting it. As Gupta explained, gas cannot emit light on its own, but the young, massive stars emit just the right type of radiation to excite the gas, and the early galaxies have lots of young stars. After comparing this emission spectrum with those found in newer galaxies populating today's universe, the researchers found that around 1% had similar features. 
the researchers said that by studying these later galaxies, which are easier to measure, they will gain important insight into the earlier galaxies and the beginnings of the universe's chemistry. As Gupta said, the chemical elements that make up everything tangible on Earth and the universe, except hydrogen and helium, originated in the cores of distant stars. So, it is critical to understand the conditions surrounding galaxies and stars in the early universe for us to better understand our own world today. So, it could be said that with this stunning finding, the $10 billion time machine is living up to its billing to tell the story of our origins in the universe's distant past. But as we said previously, James Webb could answer questions we once could never dream of. But its discoveries also open up new questions of their own, spidering in to endless possibilities. And in a recent unimaginable observation, James Webb just discovered the most distant example of a galaxy in the universe that looks like our home galaxy, the Milky Way. Notably, the unexpected presence of most distant Milky Way galaxy doppelganger poses a challenge to existing theoretical models, hinting at potential gaps in our understanding of the physical processes driving galactic formation during the early epochs of the universe. When the universe was just two billion years old, the newfound spiral galaxy, Sears 2112, appears to have featured a bar of stars and gas cutting across its heart, like a slash across a no-smoking sign. The Milky Way, also a spiral galaxy, sports a similar bar. Scientists suspect the Milky Way's bar rotates cylindrically, like a toilet roll holder does as you unravel toilet paper, funneling gas into the galaxy's center and sparking bursts of star formation. Astronomers previously thought this galactic structure marks the end of a galaxy's formative years, so it was expected to be seen only in old galaxies that may have reached full maturity, perhaps those that existed halfway through the evolution of the universe. Indeed, the Hubble Space Telescope's past observations of galaxy morphologies have shown the early universe hosted very few barred galaxies. However, the new findings, gleaned from data by the James Webb Space Telescope, conclude it may not be necessarily true that barred spirals must have roamed the universe for so long. The discovery of spiral galaxy Sears 2112 reveals galaxies that resemble our own already existed 11.7 billion years ago. When the universe had just 15% of its life, Luca Costantin, an astrophysicist at the Centro de Astrobiologia in Madrid and the lead author of the new study, said, James Webb can collect six times more light than Hubble, allowing for more detailed features of faraway galaxies to come into view. Sears 2, 112, is observed at a redshift of three when the universe was 2,100 million years old. Essentially, this means the light from the galaxy took 11.7 billion years to reach the web. This is a surprising find, as the galactic bars are seen in roughly two-thirds of all spiral galaxies. But bars are thought to have manifested about four billion years into the birth of the universe. Studying detailed morphologies of faraway galaxies is essential to understand their history, opening the door to new scenarios about galaxy formation and evolution. Study co-author Cristina Cabello who is a researcher at the Instituto de Física de Partículas y del Cosmos in Madrid, said in a statement. For instance, the presence of the bar in Sears 2-1-D-1-2 challenges current theoretical models that predict the early universe's physical conditions must have prevented the formation of barred galaxies in general. As Constantine said, theoretical predictions from cosmological simulations really struggle to reproduce such systems at those epochs. We now need to understand which key physical ingredient is missing in our models, if something is missing. Further, studies like these are also shaping our understanding of the role dark matter played in the early universe. Astronomers think 85% of all matter in the universe is dark matter. A mysterious substance, elusive to telescopic observations, because it doesn't interact with light at all. 
dark matter is thought to have radically influenced galaxy evolution and star formation from as early as 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Findings from the new study, however, show galaxy evolution, at least in the case of Sears 2112, was dominated by ordinary matter and not dark matter when the universe was about 2 billion years old. The galaxy's morphology shows that the contribution of dark matter in the galactic bar of Sears 2112 is very low and is instead dominated by normal matter, the study finds. According to study co-author Jairo Abreu, who is a researcher at University of La Laguna, this discovery confirms that the evolution of this galaxy was dominated by baryons, the ordinary matter we are made of, and not by dark matter despite its overabundance when the universe had only 15% of its actual age. Obviously, James Webb, in just one year of observations, is revolutionizing our understanding of the early universe. In the next five to ten years, I personally plan to continue exploiting its extraordinary capabilities, investigating the detailed structure of the first galaxies assembled in the universe. In another breathtaking observation, James Webb has left astronomers feeling festive as it allowed them to image a distant, colorful cluster of galaxies they have dubbed the Christmas Tree Galaxy Cluster. In this cluster, the Webb telescope discovered flickering Christmas lights in the form of 14 new transient objects, celestial objects that brighten dramatically before dating. The Winter Wonderland is officially called Max 0416 and is located about 4.3 billion light years from Earth. According to Hao Jingyan, an associate professor in the University of Missouri Department of Physics and Astronomy, we're calling Max 0416 the Christmas Tree Galaxy Cluster, both because it's so colorful and because of the flickering lights we find within it. Transients are objects in space like individual stars that appear to suddenly brighten by orders of magnitudes and then fade away. These transient objects appear bright for only a short period of time and then are gone. It's like we're peering through a shifting magnifying glass. Spotting so many transients in this galaxy was achieved by teaming the James Webb Telescope up with the Hubble Space Telescope. The sheer number of transients spotted in one go, thanks to the duo, implies there are a lot more yet to be found within the Christmas Tree Galaxy Cluster. It's almost like the Christmas gift for astronomers that'll keep on giving. The light from the Christmas Tree Galaxy Cluster began its journey across the cosmos when the solar system, now 4.6 billion years old, was newly formed and just around 300 million years old. This would ordinarily make it too faint for even the Webb telescope to see in detail. But a little trick first acknowledged by Albert Einstein made observing this cosmic Christmas a little easier. In his 1915 theory of general relativity, which concerns the nature of gravity, Einstein said objects of great mass must warp the very fabric of space and time, united as a single entity called space-time, giving rise to a curvature we experience as gravity. And when anything, including light, passes these curved regions of space, those things' paths get curved. The closer to the body of mass a thing is, the more extreme the curvature it experiences. As a result, when an object passes between Earth and a distant light source, the light from that background object takes a varied amount of time to reach us, as its path isn't following a straight line due to the curvature created by the passing object. This can ultimately cause that background object to appear amplified from our vantage point. The concept is called gravitational lensing, as the intervening object acts as a natural cosmic magnifying glass. James Webb has been tapping into this phenomenon with great success to see some of the universe's earliest galaxies, and its view of the Christmas tree galaxy cluster is its latest example. As Yan said, 
We can see so many transients in certain regions of this area because of a phenomenon known as gravitational lensing, which is magnifying galaxies behind this cluster. Right now, we have this rare chance that nature has given us to get a detailed view of individual stars that are located very far away. While we are currently only able to see the brightest ones, if we do this long enough, and frequently enough, we will be able to determine how many bright stars there are and how massive they are. The transients were found by Yan and the team as they were looking at four sets of images captured by the James Webb Space Telescope over around four months as part of James Webb's PEARLS GT01176 program. The team has identified two objects in the images as supernova explosions that happen as stars reach the end of their lifespans. Jan is thrilled by this result, as he and his team can now use those supernovas to study the galaxies in which they are happening. The two supernovas and the other 12 extremely magnified stars are of different nature, but they are all important, Jan explained. We have traced the change in brightness over time through their light curves, and by examining in detail how the light changes over time, we'll eventually be able to know what kind of stars they are. The astronomers also found something else extraordinary in the Christmas Tree Galaxy Cluster, a monster star in a galaxy, seen as it was when the universe was just three billion years old. They have named the star Mothra after the monstrous moth, kaiju, from Japanese cinema. The galaxy in which Mothra lurks was lensed to around 4,000 times its original brightness. The object lensing this galaxy is currently unknown, but Yan and the team estimate it has a mass of between 10,000 and 1 million times that of the Sun. The most likely explanation is a globular star cluster that's too faint for the James Webb Space Telescope to see directly. Jose Diego, research lead author and a scientist at the Instituto de Física de Cantabria scientist, said in a separate statement, but we don't know the true nature of this additional lens yet. What is extra interesting about Mothra's galaxy is the fact it was also visible and lensed in Hubble Space Telescope images taken nine years ago. Normally, a lensing object and a background galaxy would move out of alignment over such a period, but Mothra's home galaxy and the object lensing it seemed to have stuck together. In the future, Yan and the team hope to both figure out the nature of this lensing object and uncover some of its characteristics. We'll be able to understand the detailed structure of the magnifying glass and how it relates to dark matter distribution. This is a completely new view of the universe that's been opened by James Webb. In addition, scientists are investigating specific geological features on the largest moons of both Jupiter and Saturn that could be ideal spots for the emergence of life elsewhere in the solar system. The team, led by researchers from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, looked at what are called strike-slip faults on the Jovian moon, Ganymede, the solar system's largest moon, bigger even than the planet Mercury, and Saturn's moon, Titan. Faults like these happen when fault walls move past each other horizontally, either to the left or the right, with a famous example here on Earth being the San Andreas Fault, it's sort of like a giant crack rift or certain type of crevice in the ground. Such seismic features are generated on these icy moons, scientists believe, when these bodies orbit their parent gas giant planets. The planet's immense gravitational influences generate tidal forces that squash and squeeze the moons, inevitably flexing the natural satellite's surfaces, plus these tidal forces aren't very consistent because the orbits of both moons are elliptical, meaning they are sometimes closer to Saturn or Jupiter. Other times, they are much farther away. That, in turn, leads to even stronger tidal forces. As Lilian Burkhard, lead author of the research and a scientist at the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, said in a statement, 
We are interested in studying shear deformation on icy moons because that type of faulting can facilitate the exchange of surface and subsurface materials through shear heating processes, potentially creating environments conducive for the emergence of life. Saturn's moon, Titan, has surface temperatures of around minus 290 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 179 degrees Celsius. This is incredibly cold. Cold enough that the water of this moon actually plays the role of rock. It can crack, deform, and ultimately form faults. During its flybys of Titan, NASA's Cassini spacecraft was able to determine that this moon of Saturn may have liquid water oceans tens of miles beneath its thick shell of ice. Additionally, Titan is the only solar system moon with a dense, Earth-like atmosphere, meaning it has a similar hydrological cycle with methane clouds, rain, and liquid flowing across the surface to fill lakes and seas. For this reason, Titan is already considered one of just a few bodies in our solar system that could support life, as we know it at least. When the NASA Dragonfly mission arrives at Titan in 2034, it will send a rotorcraft lander to fly across the frigid surface of this moon in an effort to hunt for those potential biological signs. That doesn't exactly mean it'll search for bug-eyed aliens, however. At the very least, the team hopes the lander will detect the chemical building blocks of life we're familiar with. And the geologic investigations undertaken by this team and others are vital for informing the missions of spacecraft that aim to explore solar system moons like Titan and Ganymede. Elsewhere on Earth, a team of astronomers led by Heinz Wilhelm Hobers, director of the German Aerospace Center, used the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, or SOFIA, an airborne observatory to collect data on Venus's atmosphere. We were able to plan a flight route which allowed us to observe Venus, which is at low elevation, shortly before sunset for three days, each day for about 20 minutes, Hubers said. Onboard SOFIA was the Upgrade terahertz heterodyne spectrometer, which was used for the observations. Hubers explained that this particular spectrometer is especially sensitive to the frequency and wavelength of atomic oxygen, which are 4.74 terahertz and 63.2 microns, respectively. The atmosphere on Venus houses two strong currents. The lower of the two sites below 70 kilometers, or 43.5 miles in altitude, where the equivalent of hurricane force winds on Earth blow against the direction of Venus's rotation. The higher current sits above 120 kilometers, or 74.6 miles in altitude, with winds that flow in the direction of the planet's rotation. A layer of atomic oxygen exists between these two opposing atmospheric currents, Hobert says. This layer of atomic oxygen, the scientists believe, is produced by ultraviolet radiation coming from the sun, which breaks down carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide in Venus's atmosphere into atomic oxygen and other molecules. In this process, known as photolysis, high-energy photons collide with carbon molecules to force the molecules to essentially rip apart. Because the atomic oxygen is predominantly concentrated around 100 kilometers or 62 miles in altitude between the two circulation patterns, it's possible these currents play a role in distributing the substance around the planet. However, Huber says the team couldn't quite quantify this yet with their current measurements. Although he does mention they observed a local enhancement of atomic oxygen on the planet's night side, close to the line which separates day and night known as the Terminator. Possibly this enhancement could be caused by the Terminator's winds. While atomic oxygen was detected in Venus's atmosphere, it's worth noting that the concentration was much lower than what we find in Earth's atmosphere. Earth's atmosphere has roughly 10 times more atomic oxygen than Venus's does. In fact, the relatively high concentration of atomic oxygen in the atmosphere around our planet is considered a threat. These particles are responsible for some corrosion of satellites in low Earth orbit, including the International Space Station. The presence of the highly reactive oxygen on Venus, therefore, 
shouldn't pose too much of a corrosive threat to any future satellites that get sent there. Besides that, it is very interesting to measure the altitude distribution of the atomic oxygen in the Venusian atmosphere in order to understand the chemistry and physics of the atmosphere better and to compare it with Earth, says Hubers. It was important for researchers to collect data from both the day and night side of Venus, largely because the planet rotates at an excruciatingly slow pace. One day on Venus lasts 243 Earth days, or 5,832 hours. According to Hubers, the most likely explanation for this slow rotation is that the gravity of the sun-induced tides on Venus during an early stage of the planet's life cycle, when it was more or less a liquid, molten body. The rotational energy of Venus possibly worked against the formation of tides on the world due to that molten structure, and eventually scientists think it slowed to its current day rotational speed. Ultimately, the results from the study paint a picture of the Venusian atmosphere as starkly different to our own and highlight how small differences in our past can accumulate over time to result in dramatically different futures. That's all the information that we have for you today. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed today's episode, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the bell so you never miss out on future episodes. And be sure to also tell us what you think about today's content. Everyone's support motivates us to continue delivering quality content and to always improve. As always, thanks for watching and we will see you next time.